Good evening. I'm Noel Latif, President of the Foreign Policy Association, and I would like to welcome you to the inaugural Dag Hammarskjöld Distinguished Lecture on Diplomacy. We inaugurate this lecture today on the 60th anniversary of an important speech delivered by Dag Hammarskjöld before the Foreign Policy Association with the forward-looking title, New Diplomatic Techniques in a New World. I would like to recognize our joint venture partners. They are the permanent representative of Sweden to the United Nations, Morten Grunditz, Sweden's Honorary Consul General in New York, David Dangor, and Philip Hammerschald, who is the grandnephew of Doug Hammerschald. Dag Hammarskjöld was described by President Kennedy as the greatest statesman of his times. During his seven years as Secretary General of the United Nations, he played a pivotal role in defining what the United Nations is today. I am therefore delighted that the inaugural speaker in this lecture series is Jan Eliasson. Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Jan, too, has had a defining role in the life of the United Nations. Focusing only on his UN career, he has served as Sweden's permanent representative to the UN. He was the first Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs at the UN. He was the UN Special Envoy to Darfur, and he was President of the UN General Assembly. Jan shares with Dag Hammarskjöld the distinction of having served as Sweden's State Secretary for Foreign Affairs. He also served as Sweden's Foreign Minister. Nearly 25 years ago, I asked Jan to address my board of directors at the Bowery Savings Bank. Jan dazzled the board, and all these years later, I could recount for you verbatim some of the important points Jan made that afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to invite one of the foremost diplomats of our times to talk on the subject of diplomacy and peace settlement of disputes. Deputy Secretary General Jan Eliasson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President Noel. I hope I will not repeat myself from 25 years <laughs> ago. Did you forgive me? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as you understand, I'm, I'm uh, deeply uh, honored. I'm uh, proud. I am grateful to uh, be the first one to uh, deliver the Dark Hammarskjöld Distinguished Lecture uh, in Diplomacy. And to do this in this uh, great city, uh, New York, a microcosm, uh, of the world, and the home to the United Nations is, of course, a particular pleasure, and it gives an extra dimension to this evening. So I thank you very much for giving me this honor. I uh, thought I would speak about three things. I would like to start with talking a little bit about Doug Hammarskjöld. I'm very glad to see a relative of, of the Secretary General Hammarskjöld here in the room. Uh, and then I would uh, go to uh, speak about the uh, Beauty of Peaceful Settlement of Disputes, Chapter 6 of the UN Charter. Uh, and then thirdly, I will, uh, if you don't mind, uh, have a little bit of a hopefully more entertaining part on the, my own experiences of mediation. And I will try to respond to the question, what constitutes success or failure in negotiations? Pretty presumptuous, but I'll see whether I can make it uh, in the next 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, of course, I feel rising expectations from prominent ambassador from the uh, United Nations membership here. I'm very glad you also could join us, Excellencies. Let me start with uh, Dag Hammarskjöld. Of course, as you understand, for a Swede uh, who has spent his life or her life in diplomacy, he is the uh, role model. Uh, he. Uh, was a very innovative person. Person he brought in the issue of preventive diplomacy, 
uh, Quiet Diplomacy, together with Lester Pearson and uh, Sir Brian Urquhart, who many of you know and know of. Uh, he uh, uh, introduced the first peacekeeping operation in uh, the Middle East, 1956. Uh, and uh, he brought, I would say, above all, an ethical standard to the international civil servant. He really made the case that once you entered the doors of the United Nations, you served the organization, you served the principles of the uh, United Nations, the Charter. And for him, it was uh, bad taste to ask about nationalities inside his staff. He wouldn't even think about that. You should lose your national identity. You, don't, you never lose your national identity, but you should accept that we are there for the international common good. And uh, he was a great proponent of this, uh, this uh, integrity of the international civil servant. He also had another side that I think I want to uh, bring out to you. That was his uh, great interest in culture, uh, philosophy, history, knowing uh, traditions and religion. And he uh, had an enormous interest in uh, reaching out to these areas. He said to friends that he couldn't survive if he hadn't listened to a concert or spent a weekend with Barbara Hepworth discussing sculpture upstate New York. He was sitting with uh, the philosopher Buber in Jerusalem three days and uh, his colleagues getting desperate when he was going back to New York, but he didn't finish the conversation. He had a dinner in his residence here in New York uh, and uh, he told the guests to arrive to be quiet, not to say a word. The reason was that he wanted to play uh, certain pieces of Bach and Handel, and not a word was spoken. At the end of the evening, Hammarskjöld said, goodbye, didn't, <laughs> didn't we have a wonderful evening together? <laughs> they were with Handel and Bach. And so it goes. This uh, enormous identity with uh, other sources of strength inside uh, your personality. He, he gathered strength from this. He spent a lot of time on it. And many people said, how could he be such a great Secretary General? He was away all these on these cultural uh, pursuits all the time. And my answer is he probably was a great Secretary General because he had that extra dimension. And just one example which shows this special quality is when he in 1955 went to China to uh, make an attempt to uh, get a release of the 15 American airmen that had landed in China during the Korean War. They had uh, not been considered prisoners of war, but simply people who were trespassing into Chinese territory. And at that time, there were no relations, diplomatic relations between China and the United States. So Hamashal went there, and he spent two or three days with Premier Zhou Enlai. Premier Zhou Enlai was a very erudite, person more or less in the Mandarin tradition. And uh, Hammarskjöld and Joe and I found each other in their common interests in history, philosophy, etc., etc. Uh, I was told that they spoke a lot about the issue, but they spoke very much about these other issues, history, religion, and so forth. Hammarskjöld left, nothing happened. The airmen were not released. This was in January 1955. In end of July, he had his 50th birthday, Hammarskjöld. He was in Sweden, his country home. Telephone was ringing. And on the line was the Chinese ambassador in Stockholm, who said to Hammarskjöld, first of all, I want to send personal greetings from Prima Zhou Enlai to congratulate you on your birthday. And secondly, I, have, I want to tell you that the 15 American airmen are now being released. I say this because this shows this, this, uh, this uh, combination of the professional skills with the personal dimension, his interest in connecting on the level of history and culture. And that was the reason why, in the end, this was solved by a gift at the birthday of Hammarskjöld. Rather elegant also from the Chinese side, who didn't want to make a gesture at that time to the United States, I suppose. Anyway, I tell you the story only to give you a little image of the personality of Hammarskjöld and how the personal and professional go together. The uh, second part that I would like to enter is, of course, the importance of what is called in the Charter Pacific Settlement of Disputes. 
It's a beautiful poetry, isn't it? Pacific, not even peaceful. And uh, Article 33 of the Charter, and as several of you know, I always carry the Charter in the pocket. I've done so for the last 30 years, not, not this one. This is my 12th version. And Article 33 of the UN Charter is really Christmas Eve for a Swedish diplomat, or for an international civil servant, I would say, and for a lawyer also. Because this is, here is what we should do before we use force according to the UN Charter. And I am a great believer also in Chapter 7, where you open up for the use of force. But I would claim that, and I would claim that Chapter 6 wouldn't be very effective if we didn't have Chapter 7 in the end. But I, don't, my, I make the case that I think Chapter 6 is underutilized. And I ask myself how often we, sh we do this. And I, the answer is not as often as we should, and not as thoroughly as we should. Because we could save so many lives, we could so, save so much money, we could save so much night sleep, and even the reputation of our organizations, even our, including my own, if we were to do this right. And Article 33 states that the parties to any dispute shall first of all, and now listen to what we should do, count on your fingers, seek a solution by negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, resort to regional agencies, or arrangements, or other peaceful means of their own choice. Here is what diplomacy is all about. That we very often do not listen to those first signals that could lead to a, a horrible conflict. We wait until the conflict gets out of control, and then we suddenly have an action in the Security Council, decision has to be taken on peacekeeping operation, and we are already in the face when the house is on fire. I think what we need to learn is that we, instead of waiting for the house to burn down, and we see it burning in so many places in the world now, Syria is of course the worst example, apart from the horrible uh, events now in the Philippines, which is in a different uh, category. But what we need to do is not to see that house burn down, we need to get there and act when the smoke develops, or even better, when the arsonist reaches for the match. Prevention must be the, uh, the right direction for the future, and to act early should be our, 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 our primary responsibility, and Article 33, Chapter 6 provides that road. It's strange, isn't it, about prevention? We don't seem to do prevention, even if we know that it is so necessary. If you ask uh, someone from the media if he or she ever has been successful to get a headline in the press saying, the disaster did not occur. I doubt whether he would have or she would have a good answer. And you don't worry about a, a, a sore until it gets infected and so forth. The whole, the whole, the whole, the, the phenomenon that we don't seem to react until we <coughs> cross a certain line is something very basically human, but which, for which we also pay a very heavy price in international diplomacy and uh, where the people, of course, who are affected pay the heaviest price. So I, I want to plead that we, on this lecture, that we really <coughs> look at the potential of Chapter 6 and peaceful settlement of disputes. Uh, I would then w venture into my third element, which will take a little bit longer time, and that is uh, the lessons that I have drawn from six different negotiations that I've been involved in through the years, from Iran-Iraq to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh to uh, most recently Darfur. And uh, these lessons are lessons of mediation, lessons of negotiation, and perhaps lessons of diplomacy. Uh, before that, let me allow a little story that perhaps could be a good beginning to this part of the lecture. Uh, I, in my CV, I think it says that I have a long experience in conflict resolution and mediation. I didn't write it myself, but it's there. So when I was uh, delivering a speech in New York six years ago when I was president of the General Assembly, I met a group which was NGO related, and I came to this audience and I felt a little bit strange. I could not feel at home. It was a different uh, group that I normally meet, a bit of long beards and dreamy eyes, I thought, what was happening? And in front of me was the invitation to this lecture that I was giving. And then I realized that I was at the wrong place, or rather the audience was at the wrong place. But he says, come and meet Mr. Jan Liasson. He's an expert on conflict resolution and meditation. 
they had missed out on the, the misprint. But of course, I gave the same lecture, as you understand. <laughs> and nobody noticed it, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, so let, let, me, let me put it this way. I would like to answer the question, who negotiates? Uh, secondly, when do you negotiate? When do you, when do you put out your proposals and mediations? Uh, and then how? So I will try to answer very quickly the first two, a bit longer on how. The who, when, and how in negotiation. The who is, who is the mediator to call for in international conflicts? Well, there are three categories. The first is the major power, who, which can use the muscle power that this power has politically, economically. You, classically, you have Henry Kissinger in the Middle East or foreign ministers uh, getting involved uh, in the Middle East from uh, from Kissinger to, uh, to, to Secretary Kerry today. The second category is the classic UN, to choose someone who represents a neutral nation or a smaller nation, who, which has no interest in the conflict and uh, which possibly has a good record in international law and mediation. And there, our Nordic countries are fortunate to be in that category. Uh, not only the neutral countries, which was the case of the past, <coughs> Sweden, Austria, Finland, and Switzerland, which led to the UN far later, but also now Norway. Norway is really making great progress. Is there a Norwegian here? Because I rarely commend Norwegians so strongly. Please, I would like to get a point on that. But they really have done great progress, not least because they are not part of the European Union, so they can take an independent position for the European Union. The third category is some, a category which is very interested in civil war situations. Certain nations do not want to internationalize their conflicts. So in order to avoid internationalization of the conflict, they ask someone who is completely outside the United Nations or member states. You have President Carter, the Carter Center in, uh, in Atlanta that can play a role. There's a Swedish professor, Peter Wallenstein, who's famous for conflict resolution. And by inviting such a person, so-called track to diploma diplomacy, you do not by that say that this is an international conflict. Because if you bring in the international actor, you recognize that this conflict perhaps could in the end lead to secession, which could be very dangerous. So those are the three categories that I would mention in the who in mediation. The when is very interesting. It's, um, if I look back at my experience in mediation, the timing is absolutely crucial. Very often, uh, we do things too late in life, uh, not least in negotiation. But I've also been in several situations when you start when you present ideas too early. And by that, you, the, the idea is, 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 uh, is sold out if that is being rejected and you cannot come back to it. So timing is extremely important. I would say from a strictly human perspective, if you, ha if you have it in relationship to children and grandchildren, which most of us have, don't we? Uh, I would say the children are fantastic at timing. Children are fantastic at timing. In Sweden, we have something called Veckopeng which means the allowance that you get every week or month. A child would never ask for increase in the, in the allowance on a Monday night when you are on your way to work, do they? They would do it Friday night when you're relaxed with a glass of wine and uh, you know, it, week is over. That's when they say, you know, my friends have much more than I every month. Uh, I've noticed that, that instinctive capacity of children to have that. I say that only there is a parallel in mediation you have to analyze very carefully when you act. You can spoil things enormously by doing it both too late and too early. Okay, I think I then come to the how. And I would start with the language, the word. If I look around this room, I am pretty sure that 95% of you have the word as your main way of influencing your colleagues, your, the people you work, work with, your written word and your spoken word is your main tool of not only communicating but persuading. And therefore, for diplomacy, of course, the word is our most important tool. I collect words. I, since I was a child, I, I was reading encyclopedias and I remember my parents saying, stop reading, but I was having a, a, a little lamp in my bed that I could speak under the cover and then continue to read. 
And I'm so grateful that I did so, collecting these words, because when you sit in negotiation and you get stuck, and then somebody says on the other side, I would never accept this uh, formula, then you can bring out one of your five or six synonyms and turn around the paragraphs, and then you can, in front of, uh, of them, come up with a new formula. And they said, fine, glad you adapted to our, our suggestion. So I think the word is absolutely crucial. And uh, I, I, I uh, have so many examples of that. But I won't bore you with that. We have a question period also. I can give you more examples. The um, second uh, thing that I would mention, apart from timing, which belongs to this category, Osho, because timing is also the how. But the second category is cultural uh, sensitivity. That if you are to achieve result in the negotiations, negotiations that I have been involved in, it, it requires a certain curiosity uh, and knowledge uh, and interest in other countries' uh, history, tradition, culture, religion. By that, you not only create a sense of respect on the other side that you have taken those efforts and that you show this interest, but you also have a much richer life. You know, if you come to come cold to negotiation without knowing the cultural environment in which you work, uh, it's very hard to create that sense of comfort and trust that is necessary to achieve results. I, I will give you an example from a negotiation that I had in Tehran when I was shuttling between Baghdad and Tehran in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, we, I came to Tehran and, and I, I had an excellent proposal, uh, namely that we should go back to the international recognized boundaries. I had finally convinced Saddam Hussein's Iraq to agree to this principle, and I thought it was just good news to come to Iran and deliver this news, but they were very suspicious. So we were sitting three days in August 1989, I think it was. And uh, it was very hot, there was no air conditioning, it was warm, a late afternoon, and I had been sitting and making this case for two days, and I was thinking, now finally I must have a breakthrough on this. But nothing happened, the suspicion was very deep. So uh, I lost my, I, I, I lost out on the word because I said, uh, when I almost fell asleep, you know, after lunch, uh, at noon, very hot, doing the same thing for two or three days, no oxygen in the air, I really felt like I was back in high school when I fell asleep, uh, uh, you know, in the history lesson Friday afternoon. So here I am sitting as chief negotiator for the United Nations. Special representative of the Secretary General falling asleep in front of the foreign minister of Iran. And when I was almost falling asleep like this, you know, I said, blurted out, I said, uh, let's break up. And I, what, I, what, I, what I wanted was to have a break so that I could go to the hotel, take a shower, or walk in the park, or just breathe outside. But let's break up, translate into Farsi. Anyone who speaks Farsi here? Became very, very harsh words. So the foreign minister of Iran froze and said, so you do not want to negotiate anymore? He saw me disappearing to the airport probably or that I was leaving the whole negotiation. And he started to ramblingly talk about how I failed to understand that this was an issue of national security for Iran, that it takes time for them to come to decision on these issues, and now you want to break up. And I, I didn't have the chance to just sprinkle in that. I just wanted to have a little, an hour break. <laughs> so then in the end, he rhetorically asked, so if you don't want to negotiate here in Tehran, what do you want to do? It's a rhetorical question. My colleagues told me that I was quiet for an unbearable 20 seconds, leaning back on my chair because he asked me, what do I want to do in Tehran? And I was completely relaxed uh, after this that I said, well, what, if you really ask me what I want to do, I've been here for 20, 25 times in Tehran, but as of yet, I've never seen the wonderful carpet museum of uh, Persia, the Persian carpets. You have evidently a fantastic carpet museum, the best in the world, I'm told. I've never been here. You've never given me a chance to go to it. <laughs> and they looked at me as I was crazy first. <laughs> but then, at the right side of the head of delegation was fortunately a young man from Tebritz. And he said, well, my grandfather had a 
carpet store, and uh, I could I know pretty much about the tablets carpet. So if he goes, uh, I could I could join him. And then someone from Isfahan on the other side. Well, if you go, I, I, I'll come along. I know the Isfahan map, so <laughs> uh, more carpets also. So in the end, I had three three uh, from three members of the Iranian delegation accompanying me to the museum of carpets in Tehran. And I spent two hours with them. We took a break. I, they were talking like children to me. We were greatly friend and great friends. And then when I came back to the foreign minister, two hours later, the uh, man from Tabriz pointed to me and said to the Iranian delegation, which had been very skeptical to me, he said, this is our friend. This is our friend. In other words, I, without knowing it, had touched that spot, cultural sensitivity, without knowing it. That they felt that here I come, this guy from Northern Europe, uh, and interested in fact seeing the carpets that perhaps their grandparents did as child workers back in the 1920s. And it was a touching moment. After that, in the evening, believe it or not, they agreed to the formula that we had presented. The whole atmosphere was different. A long story, it's a long story, too long perhaps, but only to give you the, the flavor of what that cultural sensitivity can mean. Okay, the last point I'll make is perhaps the most important conclusion that I have when it comes to failure or success of negotiation, and that is personal relations and your own personality. Uh, I wouldn't have dared say that 20 years ago that rational arguments are not the decisive factor, but I think the fact that you have a personal relationship, you have a friendship, you have known each other for a long time, you have been in situations together on the barricades, either in negotiations or out there in the field. You have established an element of trust and friendship, and that is an enormously important capital. And in so many situations that I can recall, uh, this is what counts. Uh, and uh, that trust is absolutely crucial, and that of course leads you to certain ethical conclusions, if I now come back to Doug Hammarskjöld, about sticking to truth and showing complete integrity and never failing to stand up for those values that you, uh, that you, are, that you are asked to serve. But above all, the, 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 the importance of trust. I don't say go as far as to say that you have to instill sympathy. It wasn't easy with Saddam Hussein, for instance, whom I negotiated with for altogether 25 hours, not in one row, but on different occasions. But uh, the trust, the trust factor. And I will end with a story with, uh, which is slightly emotional, but I remember it so well. I was perm rep uh, ambassador here in 1988 to 92, end of Cold War. It was a wonderful period in terms of uh, seeing the tensions, uh, the, uh, the sort of wet, wet blanket of the Cold War was lifted up. We were working in completely new constellations. It didn't matter whether you were NATO or Warsaw Pact. Uh, we started work with, on a personal basis. Uh, we were about 10, 12 ambassadors who became very close friends. And we met at lunches and breakfasts. And I must say now that had we agreed in that group, it was pretty sure that we would get it through in the different committees or even in the General Assembly when that agreement among us had been reached. I left that group, uh, we all left, of course. Six years later, I was Deputy Foreign Minister of Sweden, and I came to uh, Algeria. And I met the uh, Deputy Foreign Minister, my colleague, who came to the airport, which is pretty unusual, because we are pretty businesslike on the Deputy Minister level. But he was there, and he, I was, thank you very much for coming out. Well, of course, remember, how we had a great time in, in New York. I said, yes, of course. Uh, and then I started to be a bit sentimental, and said, well, we did a great work, didn't we? You remember you and I did the resolution on the Israel-Palestine issue that year, and we got the consensus, almost consensus resolution uh, adopted. And then it said, well, je m'en souviens vaguement. I remember vaguely. And I got a bit upset. Why? Vaguely? Have you forgotten our little period? Have you forgotten our work on the Middle East resolution? And then he got serious and said, I'll tell you what I remember about you. What was that? Well, one morning, 1991, a person from my delegation came into the room where we were sitting in the UN and told me that my wife had had a horrible traffic accident on her way from Long Island to New York. She had chosen to go Monday morning, he had chosen to go Sunday night, and she was run into by a truck. 
It wasn't sure whether she had died or not at that accident, but I remember my colleague, and that, this image came back to me I, and when I was sitting in the car with him in Algier. And then I realized, I remember that he left and I asked his assistant what happened and he told me the story and I couldn't stay because I got so upset that his wife might be dying. So I went back to my office and I wrote with the predecessor of this pen a handwritten note to him which I sent with my driver to his mission. And now he comes back to me in the car when I'm there on the visit and he says, I want you to know that when I was up in my mission I heard that my wife fortunately was alive and by the way she did survive. I went to the car and there comes your driver with a letter. And I take, I open your, the letter in the car. He had never told me this story. And I opened it avec mon doigt, with my thumb. And this letter, this letter I still have on the top of my, at my table, first drawer. And that is what I remember about you. Uh, this, this says it all to me. He had forgotten the, the resolution on Israel-Palestine. But he remembered that I wrote a letter to him about his wife, that I was at his side at that moment. I say another long story, only to give the example of the power of personal relations, and the power also perhaps of personality. The fact that in life you need to have, you need to have passion to get things done. Without passion nothing happens in life, but also you need to have compassion. Without passion nothing happens. Without compassion the wrong things happen. And I think I could conclude by that. I think that word, that, that, that twin combination of words could fit Doug Hammarskjöld very well also. And I'm extremely honored, deeply honored to give this lecture to you here in New York. The first time the Doug Hammarskjöld uh, lecture. And I thank you very much for the invitation. I thank you all for coming here tonight. I was asked by Noel whether I could take uh, questions, and uh, I have a slightly masochistic nature, so uh, <laughs> I have no problems with uh, doing that. If I can answer them, is something else, but uh, if there are any questions on, of course, any issue. Uh, I've been speaking about this uh, subject rather academically, uh, but of course uh, the realities on the ground and on the, on the 38th floor are quite different, uh, and to translate these beautiful principles to uh, the work in today's uh, rather rather difficult world is another thing. So you can widen the questions to any subject uh, that you think uh, is uh, related to the United Nations. Roger Wilson has a question. Thank you for that delightful uh, talk. In light of the WikiLeaks um, disclosures, to your point about personal relationships, what impact do you think that what that will have going forward in terms of all the work that's been done vis-a-vis um, -vis the diplomatic corps in terms of what these leaks have meant on a national basis to, between countries? I, I could take several so I, that I don't uh, monopolize here. I see uh, another question. Yeah, well, I see two. I see two. Uh, I'll test you. Um, Yes, sir. I was uh, at a meeting at the Swedish Embassy Monday with several perm reps and NGOs and other organizations concerned about what's happening with the civilian population uh, in Syria. And I was struck by th the concern that was expressed by so many people representing so many nations. But it seems at the end of that meeting that there was no definitive action that could be taken or worse actions that were suggested and words like genocide were used and as we said here in this safe place this beautiful place uh, at this moment there are people in traumatic terrible circumstances what does that say about the United Nations ability to respond to situations like this and what in your judgment should be done that is not yet being done. I can take uh, one or two more there up, up the line. There, yeah. Good evening, Your Excellency. Um, my question um, is more to your work as um, special envoy to the Secretary General in Darfur regarding the plight of internally displaced persons and the work since um, the implementation of the guiding principles. Um, if you can speak to that, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
So I test my simultaneous capacity. My wife claims that we men are bad at this, but I'll trust. Uh, a fourth, fourth question, I saw the lady there. No? Yeah. Yes, um, I, first I wanted to say I remember meeting you at another lecture and I was particularly impressed uh, given that I had asked a question and I had a response from you the, early the next morning on my computer. So <laughs> that's the personal touch that you talk about, I think. And I'd like to ask you, as somebody who's also interested in prevention, what do you think could have been done to prevent the civil war in Syria? And secondly, if I might, uh, what do you think is the role of women in diplomacy? Thank you. OK. Well, there is so much to the uh, WikiLeaks uh, issue and, and, of course, the whole issue of Internet and Snowden and all that. I, I will not uh, disappear into that whole debate, but I think the, the issue which relates to trust and diplomacy is, of course, the fact that with those leaks were also uh, much, much said about the sources of information. Uh, and uh, I, I have heard that the New York Times, which printed the first version, tried to avoid the, that type of information, but they, I don't think they were fully successful. <laughs> so there are lots of embarrassing uh, situations where you know, someone is uh, on record of having said things which certainly would hurt uh, not only the uh, diplomatic, the quality of diplomatic communication, but also this the security of this person, and that I saw as a major headache in this regard. And if the WikiLeaks would lead to uh, the, that the quality of in diplomatic exchange goes down, because you think that next time it's out there, uh, then of course it's, uh, you reduce the, the, the quality of the words by first category. You need to be absolutely clear. There are those who say that when you are so diplomatic, they say that when they don't understand what you're saying. To me, that's a very bad definition of diplomacy. Diplomacy, to me, is clarity. So that you know what you have conveyed and you know that the cable going back is correct. And if you buy that, those leaks introduce an element of, I don't know what I can say, neither on the phone nor in the conversation. <coughs> There's going to be a memo, and then it's going to come out uh, a month or a year from now. Then you, it does create some problems. This, uh, having said this, I'm all in favor of transparency. And, uh, in the United Nations, of course, we, we, we actually have rather few secrets. We, we try to work with complete transparency. But uh, it is a dilemma. Governor, um, and I will combine that, I think, with the question on uh, the uh, civil war uh, and the prevention of civil wars. Um, I, I think the, what I said only in passing, but I could have developed much more uh, at that stage of my lecture, I think we do not sufficiently react at the early warning signals. Uh, we have very few and weak methods of acting on early warning signals. I would say one of the most important early warning signals that tells you that something is going to be getting very bad, even horrible, even end up in an atrocity, is violations of human rights. We should really watch out for human rights violations, because they are the first vibrations in the ground. When those vibrations start, and a father of the family is tortured because of ethnic background, or color of his skin, or sectarian belonging, or religious belief, then it's getting dangerous. Because that's when you start to divide humanity into us and them. And that's when you start to see, put this seed in that we're not all equal. And I would hope that we in the United Nations will react much more clear, clearly and even forcefully. Uh, I don't mean by force, of course, but really come out with those signals. In the Security Council, there is something called horizon scanning, which opens up for discussing situations that could get worse. But unfortunately, doing that means that you enter an area which by many states is considered interference in internal affairs. You don't want to be reminded that things in your country can turn into not only a civil war, but in the worst of case, ethnic cleansing, or even the word that you mentioned, the G word. But there has to be a much more active, step ta active steps taken at that first time. Because if we don't do it, 
Then we pay the price next stage, which is, which is protection of civilians, when the horrors begin, which is usually massive violations of, of uh, human rights. And therefore, I think we need to ask ourselves, what is it then that can do, you can do at that stage? I think Security Council has a very major responsibility. They should act on threats to international peace and security. What is the threat? It's before it has happened, isn't it? Threats to international peace and security, it's before. But also we, Secretary General and, and I, we need to be able to send out fact-finding missions, suggest preventive deployment of civilian observers. Uh, there was an example in Macedonia, Morten, remember, where we had preventive deployment in Europe, as Swedish troops were there. Uh, and uh, then, of course, use this beautiful uh, Article 33. All these methods should be used. So I, I think we have an obligation not to stop when we see those signs first. Because we have this tendency, remember? Did you have a headline about in the press, the disaster did not occur? We don't want to do it, see it until it gets absolutely critical. So that's my rather passionate appeal for action on first warning signals. And that, of course, brings me to the question of uh, what could have been done in, in uh, Syria. Of course, this could have been completely different if those first signs of, of, uh, of reactions of uh, uh, the young children at the beginning and then uh, youth and uh, a demonstration took place, if that had been dealt with in such a way that you had listened seriously to those groups and found ways of uh, communication. But, of course, the road was chosen of confrontation. And when violence starts, then uh, it's, it's a vicious circle, it gets worse and worse. And then uh, the horror, uh, the, one of the horrors of, of going through this is that it gets more and more difficult with every, with every month. Because the sacrifices get are more and more. The revenge factor strengthens. And the extremist groups usually get stronger by years. The present groups on the field in Syria, which dominate militarily, are groups that were very weak two years ago. <coughs> the groups that are related to Al-Qaeda. They were not at all there two years ago, and very weak a year ago, but now they are there. So you will see a, a growing difficulty in dealing with the conflicts the longer you wait. So the preventive uh, message is very strong also when you enter the stage when the conflict already started. I was mediating, I was helping mediate in Iran-Iraq in the beginning we had a proposal to the Iranians, Iraqis, 1981, one year after the, the war broke out. I was a young diplomat, that's why I first uh, started Mediate. We presented a proposal in 1981, and I will tell you, seven years later, it was, it was rejected by both sides, by the way. Seven years later, almost the same proposal was accepted. Resolution 598 of 1988, which led to the ceasefire. The difference is 700,000 people killed three million refugees, and hatred between Shia and Sunni, which you still see pay the price for. So, uh, of course, this should have been dealt with much earlier, and I would also have hoped that the Security Council could have acted and bring about that unity earlier than they did this time. It, this time it took chemical weapons to remind us of the importance of unity in the Security Council. Uh, it would have been, for instance, very good if after Kofi Annan presented the model of negotiation 30th of June last summer that we could have seen a unified security council. And this, of course, has made life difficult for Kofi Annan to begin with and Lakta Brahimi now. Our muscles are pretty weak when uh, it comes to bringing about a solution if you don't have a strong security council resolution. But we still hope that this step forward with the chemical weapons destruction which is going on, which I think is handled very well by all concerned and we have tried our best to be there in the field now, make sure that we will destroy those weapons by the middle of next year. We hope that this, that first step will be followed by also tangible steps forward on humanitarian access, which is really a huge problem because the fighting goes on. Uh, and we have problems both with cross-border and cross-lines uh, operations, as you probably heard in your conversation last night, Governor. Uh, and now we, of course, need also to uh, look at the situation from the neighboring states, if we ever doubted that we see a threat to international peace and security, you can just look at the dangers for Lebanon and Jordan and the, the regional dangers involved. And here I come back to the sectarian and religious dimensions 
Many Syrians don't speak about themselves anymore as Syrians. They speak about themselves as Alawites, Sunnites, Kurds, Druze, Christians. What happens when you speak about yourself in those categories? The conflict goes abroad because all these factors go right into Lebanon, right into Iraq. And that means this poison is spreading because you divide up humanity along ethnic and religious lines. So that's the tragedy of, uh, of this conflict. Uh, I went to the Secretary General last fall and I told him the Lacta Brahimi, and just to give you an impression of how, we, how much we all have felt frustration about this, and I told Senator Ban Ki-moon, I'm glad to tell you that uh, Lacta Brahimi is going to see President Assad. Oh, great, he says, uh, when? Well, it's in 10 days because he's, he, he will be received on this and that day, 10 days from now. And then uh, Ban Ki-moon was quiet for five seconds and so on, and then he said, 10 days, that's 1,000 to 1,500 people dead. So he didn't, that's a great song from Sting. <laughs> yeah, Robert Redford. Yeah. <laughs> so he didn't think in terms of, uh, he didn't think in terms of the days. He, terms of one, he thought in terms of 100, 150 people dying every day. So that's about the feeling we have about this. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it, wasn't it? Uh, no, Darfur, of course, of course. Well, we had, we, what we, I was negotiating with Salim Salim from the African Union. I think it was an excellent cooperation between the African Union and uh, United Nations. I was reporting together with him to the Peace and Security Council in Addis Ababa. He came with me to the Security Council here. We reported together. We were completely coordinated and there was not a difference between us. So I think in the diplomatic field, I think that was a very successful operation. Uh, when we came, uh, it coincided with the lull in the fighting, uh, but the, the conflict was still there. It wasn't the horrific dimensions as it was in 2003 to 5, but uh, I think we got something that could be considered a reasonably or a decent cessation of hostilities. But uh, the basic problems are still there. And uh, the problems are continuing not only in Darfur, but also in South Kordofan and Blue Nile. Uh, and I had hoped, and many of us had hoped, that the peace agreement and the, the independence of South Sudan would lead to a uh, relaxed relationship between the two and sharing of resources, of course, above all, oil. There was a breakdown of this for a year. Now it's normalized, now the relations are improved, but still tenuous. So uh, I don't think we, we, we will see the last of the uh, Sudan crisis. Uh, I follow it very, very closely. And I would hope that in the end, the government of Khartoum will see the importance of sharing both wealth and, uh, and uh, power in the country. The two issues that were the key for the negotiations that I dealt with was wealth sharing and power sharing. And if you gather the wealth and you gather the, the, the power in one area and not, not see the importance of reaching out to the periphery in a the country, then you have these uh, new elements of, that could lead to uh, in the case of Sudan's secession and in the case of Darfur, uh, 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 f far reaching uh, autonomy. So we still have work to do, but uh, we will continue to, to do our best to one step at a time. I, met, I worked with the Prime Minister uh, once, and uh, I was uh, his national security advisor. I had half an hour every day, and I had five or six points uh, with him. And he taught me a good lesson when I was in too much of a hurry to bring out my five, six issues. He said, Jan, close, slow down, slow down. One hell at a time. <laughs> One hell at a time. It's a very good rule because you've got to focus on what you do now. <laughs> so I focused on Sudan when I, and then I moved to Somalia, and Mali, and Afghanistan. Okay, we'll take, uh, if you know, it's okay? Uh, it doesn't a couple, a couple of, of yeah. Maya. Um, hello, thank yeah. you. Um, question about the future of the UN. How uh, do you think its uh, effectiveness worldwide uh, may be enhanced uh, other than humanitarian work it does great work? Also, in the same vein, uh, the recent 
increasement increase of the military prerogative in Africa. Is that uh, is that a trend? So, say, last question. The the recently increased military prerogative of the United UN in Africa. I'm wondering if that's a trend or a sign of things the, to the come. The military, sorry, the military. The the increased activity of the UN in Africa with their military. I see. Military. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. One more. Yeah. Okay. Two more. Uh, sir, my question concerns the very important role. United Nations plays in disaster relief and in planning for it and coordinating. And specifically with respect to the terrible disaster in the Philippines, where the situation is all the supplies they need, water, food, medical, everything, they've got them in abundance in the Manila area. Uh, how do you get them to the people? The, there was uh, looting, and that has been solved to a large extent by sending in the military. Now, uh, what the obvious solution is to get a, a lot of heavy transports from America and from European countries, uh, load them up in uh, Manila airports, and airdrop them. And now that the military on the, are on the ground, it would seem that there's an opportunity to drop them to the military who can then arrange for orderly distribution. Uh, would you care to comment, sir? Yeah, I'll take one more, then I think we'll... There's a lady over there. Yeah. Your Excellency, thank you very much for a most engaging presentation. You spoke about timing, and uh, there's another Robert Redford movie called All is Lost. Uh, today uh, in movie theaters, but I wanted to to narrow it down to Cyprus. What happens when uh, there's a negotiation going on for 40 years? Is it all is lost or should we have hope? And what's your take on that? Thank you. Okay. Future of the UN. Uh, are you willing to stay for half an hour? Or no? <laughs> <laughs> no, but... Uh, I, I, I think that if we were to um, leave and this, let this organization, organization uh, disappear, I think we would gather tomorrow and we would struggle to create as good a charter as this one, with or without veto power, of course, but it would be the most disputed one. I often say that to my colleagues, and some of them are here today, that we have to understand that the United Nations is a collection of states. We are represented here by states. But we should always remind ourselves and them that the states are here to serve those who are mentioned in the first three words of the Charter, which is we the peoples. We the peoples. But if we sort of idealistically think that we can start from the image of an ideal world, we will not do their job right. So I say to my colleagues, you got to accept the world as it is, whether you like it or not. UN is a reflection of the world as it is. Don't try to I'd make an idyllic picture of this. There are human rights violations, there are dictatorships, there are conflicts, there are horrors. This is the, the reality, that's where you start the analysis. But then I say, you must never forget that uh, the other dimension is this organization stands for the world as it should be. The world as it should be. And I claim that our job is, and maybe this is more basically human, our job is to diminish the gap between the world as it is and the world as it should be. That's our job. And this is a slow, tough, hard job. I am often sitting at meetings in the 38th floor gathering people around post-2014 Afghanistan, post Afghanistan, Mali, whatever, post-2015 development agenda. But I can tell you, when I get out there in the field, and I've been out in the field a lot, uh, I was emergency relief coordinator back in the 90s, I'm reminded of what we do out there in the field. And I have a little, little 
card here that I promise you, anyone who wants this for your dinner conversations when you and is criticized, it's not bad. Because here I just give you some figures that are perhaps helpful. We provide food for 90 million people in 73 countries. We vaccinate 58% of the world's children, saving 2.5 million lives a year. We assist over 36 million refugees and people fleeing war, famine, or persecution. We have peacekeepers in 16 operations on four continents, 120,000 peacekeepers. We mobilize 12.4 billion in humanitarian aid to help people affected by emergencies. This is just half of what's on this little card. And when I see those people out there in the field, like I was last week in Somalia, and see the, them working under these conditions, doing this job, uh, with risk for their lives, I, I'm full of admiration. But I'm also the first one to say, sir, that we have a lot of improvement to do. We should learn much more to mobilize the whole UN, to mobilize with the ACT, with the civil society, act with, civil, with the private sector, act with the World Bank, and work much more horizontally rather than vertically. I think we, far too often in life, and also organizations in our countries, work too much in silos. Today's problems need to be worked with horizontally, and I like, would like to introduce that method of work in the UN. Your second part is about the military, the ro growing role of military. Here's a huge dilemma, because we are now faced with, not with the classical peacekeeping situations of the past. In Mali, we were faced with half of the country taken over by extremists and terrorists, and of course, the United Nations classically has to maintain neutrality and impartiality. But it's very hard to maintain impartiality and neutrality vis-a-vis -vis such groups. That is the situation in several of our situations, in our positions where we are right now, Somalia, Al-Shabaab, uh, Taliban in Afghanistan. Our operations are operations where we probably have to do both the classic peacekeeping and classic civilian work, helping uh, with the humanitarian work, development work, but then for the security, there is need both for classic peacekeepers, but also, I would suppose, a more muscular presence. And in Mali, there is a French force available in Bamako. In the case of DRC in Congo, we have so-called intervention brigade, which now played quite an important role in, in, uh, in uh, dealing with one particular uh, uh, group that was fighting uh, the uh, government and also fighting the UN group. This is a dilemma because by taking that step, being involved in those operations, we also become targets. So th our life has become much more dangerous because we, don't, we have people on the other side with whom you can't maintain the classic neutrality. But uh, in DRC, it is considered a success story that we did not stand aside but dealt with this military threat that existed. But it is, of course, a situation that causes concern because we will indeed in some cases, provide the other side with so-called soft targets. And I've seen enough of that. Uh, the um, disaster relief, well, of course, Philippines. I talked to the key people I was in contact with, Valerie Amos, uh, uh, yesterday and today. In the Philippines, uh, it, is a, it is the worst uh, typhoon uh, hurricane that has ever occurred in, 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 uh, in history. Uh, it is an absolutely unbelievable uh, tragedy and uh, uh, the logistical problems are enormous. We shouldn't underestimate the Philippines government and authorities' capacity. They have had a lot of typhoons in that area, but the size of this was enormous. Uh, can you imagine a seven meter high cyclone wave that goes 12 kilometers, I think, inside the country. So the evacuation sites to which people had been evacuated were flooded also. Uh, and now, we, of course, this is a problem which goes beyond the immediate humanitarian phase because you have uh, not only crime coming up, but you have uh, probably a thousand or a couple of thousand of women who are pregnant or expecting to have children in the next uh, week or so. What will happen when there's not a drop of clean water? And you have the risk of disease, of course, enormous risk of disease right now. But we, we, we are, the, it is in a situation, an area which is very hard to reach. Islands, can you imagine? When this flood wave has gone over this area, it's uh, to be compared to the tsunami uh, of 2004. So it's an absolutely incredible task, but uh, I hear that from all over now, the resources are coming, 
and uh, the US military particularly, but also other military are getting involved and helping out, as they did in the tsunami case. Uh, I have an experience from airlifting. It's not very effective. Uh, I think that rather the, the uh, transportation by naval units to the islands would be better. Airlifts are, are, are pretty traumatic experiences. I've been doing that, uh, not personally, but I've been guiding those in the past. And it's not very effective, but I'm very glad the military are involved in helping in these operations now. But it's, it's an absolutely incredibly huge task. And um, we, we don't know the extent of, of the damage yet. The um, timing uh, and, well, well, uh, we sh you should never give up, of course. Uh, it's undignified to give up. You cannot give up, of course. But I must say, in certain situations, uh, you have to be very innovative and come up with new formulas. Uh, but in mediation, uh, you have to have a minimum of political will. If you look at those horribly difficult situations like Cyprus, uh, like, uh, of course, Israel-Palestine, uh, like this present situation in Syria, then if there is still belief on any of the sides that this, can be, this battle can be won by domination or military victory, then there's very little a mediator can do. A mediator is a little bit like a person who brings horses to a water hole. You know, you drag the horses to the water hole, but has anyone in this room ever been able to force a horse to drink? No, you can't force a horse to drink. Try it, you won't like it. <laughs> and uh, this is the case. I, I have been offered to mediate in certain conflicts, but when I have analyzed this with the two parties, or then I found that one of them didn't believe in a political solution. Why should I, why should I sp waste my time? I don't say it's go that, it goes that far in those conflicts, because we have to keep working. But in the end, of course, there will be questions asked whether in the end there has to be an imposed solution that the uh, major powers and Security Council may have to uh, enforce. But of course, you, in today's democratic environment, it's not uh, the most tasteful thing to do. But if the conflict is continued warfare and danger for the whole region, uh, I think that possibility should never be discarded. Okay, I think uh, by that uh, I've kept your patience, perhaps uh, strained your patience, but I, I thank you very much for, for inviting me.